But I realize that with Mother's Day, some of you might be guests here visiting, maybe with some family and friends or watching online as visitors. We're in the second part of a series we began a couple of weeks ago called The Greatest Chapter. I know that you might debate this, which is the greatest chapter. Is it really Romans chapter 8? Well, hopefully at the end of the series, you, th- you will agree that if, if not the greatest, it's at least on the Mount Rushmore of greatest chapters of the Bible. It's among the greatest chapters, and we're going to explore why together uh, as we go through this series. But first, let's pray and ask God to speak to us through his word. Father, we've sung your praises and recited your word and covenanted together about the raising of children. And now we come to your, your word and ask you to speak to us through it. We believe, as you've told us, that it's living and active and able to penetrate our minds and hearts and our very souls. We confess that we need it. We also confess that sometimes we resist it. So now as we share this moment together, Lord, open our minds and hearts that we might hear from you. We pray this in your name. Amen. When I was in high school, um, I I became serious about my faith as a 17-year-old. I uh, was really growing and a kind of a, awakening spiritually. And I was a part of Fellowship of Christian Athletes, FCA. I started going there just because uh, some friends of mine went and some other girls that I liked went. And uh, the FCA sponsor was a coach and a friend and encouraged me to go. But as I began to grow in my faith, I really was taking these things seriously. I remember in my junior year, we went to an FCA Chicagoland sports rally. And the guest speaker was a man named Mike Singletary, middle linebacker for the 85 Chicago Bears, the greatest football team that's ever existed. Okay. <laughs> Anyway, and he was talking about his faith in Christ. He gave a great testimony and a powerful gospel call. And I was mesmerized, not just because that he was a football idol, but because of what he was saying. It was speaking to my soul. And I had a couple of friends that I had invited to go with me. One of them I knew was a Christian. The other one wasn't. And afterwards, we were talking about it. And I, I was so captive by, by all the things that Singletary said, I wanted to talk about it with my friends. My friend who was a Christian was also excited. My friend who wasn't said, yeah, I could have done it without the God, all the God stuff. It didn't really make any sense to me. I loved hearing the stories about, you know, his play, on the field, but it didn't make any sense to me when he talked about God. How is it possible that three high school guys in the same school, same group of friends, playing the same sport, having the same experience, one would be blessed, the other would be bored. One would be fired up and captivated, the other would be, that doesn't make any sense and dismissive. I think the answer to that question lies at the heart of what Paul is going to say to us in the passage we're going to look at today in Romans. It's an example of what's happening when Paul describes what it means to be in the spirit or in the flesh. Now, there's going to be some Christianese. You know what that is? I'm going to write a book someday called How to Speak Christianese. All the words, if you're outside the church, that only make sense to those that are inside. There's some language we're going to use, and I'll try to explain, so don't get lost in the terminology. Last week, if you missed it, we had a break in our series. Pastor John Kelly preached to us about about unity in the gospel and what really changes us and what we're made for, our purpose. Uh, And he did a fantastic job. I would encourage you, if you missed it, to go online and watch that sermon. And two weeks ago, we began this series. Now, we're going to look at this passage. And Paul is examining the the dynamics of the Christian life. This week and next week are called Life in the Spirit. He's going to talk about what does it mean to live the Christian life. And the word spirit or Holy Spirit or the Spirit shows up 21 times in chapter 8. Only three times in the first seven chapters of Romans. Paul, when he talks about the Christian life, he's saying you can't even talk about this. We can't even begin to talk about what it means to live the Christian life unless you understand the Spirit. It's an impossibility without the Spirit. Most of us, many of us, suffer from an impoverished view of the Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. And we're trying to live the Christian life in ourselves, by our own strength, in our own ability. And it is not possible. So let's look at Romans 8, verses 5 through 11. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. 
If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. That last verse is so powerful, verse 11. And I realize maybe you read through that and you've heard it before and you're tracking, but if it's the first time, there's a lot of flesh, spirit, in the, spe- in the flesh, in the spirit. I, what I, you, it can get a little confusing. What's he talking about? Paul can pack a lot into a few verses, can't he? Let's try to unpack some of these things. In order to make sense of this whole section, we need to grasp what Paul is not saying. And it's easy, it's very easy and very common to totally miss this. Paul is not saying, if you're a Christian, if you're a follower of Jesus, that sometimes you're in the flesh and sometimes you're in the spirit. It sounds like that if you're not careful. But we fluctuate between being in the flesh and being in the spirit. I'm having a good day spiritually, I'm having a bad day spiritually. I'm trusting God, I'm trusting myself. That can be true of us, but that's not what this passage is talking about. We can fluctuate in our faithfulness, in our sensitivity, in our obedience, in our prayerfulness, but he's not talking about how wishy-washy we can be. He's talking about something has happened to you and your position has changed. Your identity has changed. Your condition and reality has been changed by Christ. I think people generally tend to think about three categories of, of uh, religious folks or Christians. There's non-Christians, I don't believe. There's regular, run-of-the-mill, ordinary Christians, like most of us. And then there's the super spiritual Christians. Do you think this way? Maybe you're not going to admit it because you know I'm going to tell you you're wrong. But th- we tend to think this way, right? There's, there's non-Christians, there's regular, run-of-the-mill Christians who struggle. Then there's the super spiritual types. What Paul is saying is, that's not the case at all. That there are only two different kinds of people. Right? Did you ever see the movie Caddyshack? <laughs> two kinds of people in this world, Danny. Those who stand for goodness, and those who stand for badness. Which kind of person are you, right? If you haven't seen that movie, well, you could probably Google that. There's, Paul says there's two kinds of people. In the flesh, or in the spirit. According to the flesh, or according to the Spirit. That's how he puts it. Let's look at Romans 8, verse 4. In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. You see it right there in this very verse. I get to play with this now. We're just going to choose blue today, because I didn't like green last time. According to the flesh, or according to the Spirit. There are two kinds of people. Two different kinds of people is the first point here. When you get right down to it, there's not rich and poor, Republican, Democrat, conservative, liberal, right and left, wise and foolish. There's all kinds of superficial categories we create to label people. But according to what Paul is saying, fundamentally, you're either in the flesh or in the spirit. Now remember, we talked about this last week, that when Paul uses the word flesh, he's talking about, um, by the way, two different kinds of people. Two different kinds of people. <laughs> according to the flesh, according to the spirit. Next one. There we go. Okay, good. Whoop, back one. Okay, good. According to the flesh and according to the spirit. He's saying flesh is the, and spirit are operating systems. Flesh means sinful nature. There's two operating systems or realities that are diametrically opposed. So to be in the flesh means I'm, I'm living according to a particular kind of operating system. The way I see the world, the way I think, the way I act. Does it mean that somebody who's in the flesh can never do a good thing or is never kind or generous or forgiving? That can happen. Does it mean who someone's in the spirit is never, uh, never screws up, never tells a lie, never stumbles? Of course that can happen. But we're in, he's saying those are two different realities. And for the believer in Christ, you don't fluctuate between the two. You were here in the flesh, and now you're according to the spirit. He says, your basic orientation in life is either destroying you or it's energizing and liberating you. There's a trajectory here based on your condition because of what Christ has done. So a Christian is not somebody who vacillates between these two. You might feel that reality, but this is not talking about how you feel in a moment. It's talking about the objective reality of what has happened to you in Christ. If you're in Christ, Romans 8, 1, then you are in the Spirit because the Spirit dwells in you. To put it another way, Paul is not talking about a daily decision that you make. You don't wake up and say, today I'm going to live in the Spirit. 
You can say that, but if you're in Christ, you already are. It's not something you choose. It's been done to you. So you walk in that. Now, I'm going to belabor this point because it's so easy for us to get this wrong. And it's so critical for us to understanding what it means to live the Christian life. Keep this in your mind as we go. Because it's going to come back over and over throughout this text and throughout the rest of the chapter. Let's look at verse 5, Romans 8, 5. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds, this is a key phrase, set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. So there's, the, there's this idea that how you live has to do with what your mind is set on. And what your mind is set on is based on who you are. So once again, I'm not choosing. It's easy to, oh, I'm just going to change my mindset. That's not what he's saying. He's saying if you're in Christ, you've been transformed. You've been changed. Your identity and position has been changed. You didn't do it. God did it for you in Christ. And if that's true, you're now in the Spirit, and you have a new mindset. You've been given a new mind. You think and see the world differently than you did before. Going back to my friend who didn't understand anything that was said at that FCA rally. Why? It didn't make sense to him. It's operating with a different system, the flesh versus the spirit. Again, it sounds like Paul is saying we choose to set our minds on things. That's not what he's saying. Now, let me just have a little side here. You can, as a follower of Jesus, and you should, exercise discipline in your mind. In Philippians 4, verse 8, there's this plaque my wife used to have over the bathroom of our kids' bathroom in the hallway that says, whatever is true, whatever is right, whatever is excellent or praiseworthy or noble or lovely, if anything is worthy of praise, think about such things. We can make the choice to think about the things of God. But again, Paul here is talking about if you're in Christ, then the Spirit dwells in you, and you've been given a new mind. You've been given the ability to do that in a way you do not have if you're in the flesh. He's talking about two different minds. Two different minds. These two different minds reflect two different uh, kinds of people. The flesh and the spirit. So what does it mean to set your mind? Actually, how do you do that? Or how does that happen to somebody? Remember in, uh, in, in Matthew, Jesus uh, is talking about his, the fact that he's going to have to die. God's purpose and plan for him. His, the, re the reason he came. And Peter, hearing this, thinks, this is bad for morale, Jesus. Stop talking so negatively. And he says, may it never be, Lord. What does Jesus say? He says to Peter, get behind me, Satan. Yeah. <laughs> for you do not have your mind set on the things of God, but the things of this world. Now, he doesn't mean, Peter, you got to change your mindset. Peter, you just got to get bit more educated. Peter, you got to do some more praying. you got to get your, pray your way out of this mindset. He's saying, Peter, you are not thinking at all about the purposes of God. And no matter how hard Peter tries, this will not happen for Peter because he will later deny Jesus until what? Until he meets the resurrected Jesus. Until Peter has an account with the risen Christ. So you don't think your way out of this issue. You don't study your way out of this issue. Something has to happen to you. Two different minds. A mind that prefers, inclines toward, delights in the things of the Spirit. Or a mind that prefers, inclines toward, and delights in the things of the flesh or sinful nature. Doesn't mean any people in the flesh never have a good thought, or people in the Spirit never have a bad thought. That, that certainly happens. It means... As you look at the way you think now, if you're a believer in Jesus, does your mind prefer the thoughts of Christ and the things of the Spirit, incline toward the thoughts of God, and delight in the thoughts of God? The things which used to excite you and delight you, now you don't find exciting, and sometimes you even go, how could I have ever loved that? What was, what was I thinking, in other words? Because you were thinking according to the flesh. By the same token, the person who's in the flesh thinks, I don't understand these Christians. What, how can they believe in the spaghetti monster in the sky? How can they believe this nonsense? It doesn't make any sense to me. And it's not going to unless you're given a new mind. This is what Paul is saying to us. If you're in the Spirit, you've been changed. Let's look at what he talks about, the mindset on the flesh. 
And it gets a little dicey here. It's a little uncomfortable to read. Paul sets out to describe these two different minds, and it's not a description of two types or levels of Christians again. He's talking about two diametrically opposed views of the world and ways of operating. Look at uh, verses 6 through 8. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. Again, he's not talking about we fluctuate from death to life. He's saying you've been brought from death to life, given a new mind. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. Look at these qualities here. Hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot, and they cannot please God. Yikes. The mind set on the flesh is hostile to God, doesn't submit to God, cannot submit to God, and cannot please God. Now, the flesh, in verse 6, the operating spirit that, of the sinful nature that eventually leads to death, physical and spiritual death, meaning separation from God. The operating system of the spirit is grace leading to life and peace. So to put it simply, if you're in the flesh, your mind's set on the things of the flesh, the sinful nature, you, you live according to the flesh, and therefore you die. Who you are impacts how you think, which impacts how you behave, which impacts your destination, trajectory. In verses 7 and 8, Paul's, this inability Paul's talking about, it's not due to like a, some mental defect. It doesn't mean that these people that are in the flesh, like they, they, are, uh, they have lower IQs or something spiritually, or they need more education. It's talking about that their inability to obey God comes from their very nature. They don't want to. Their will is an expression of their nature. To live, breathe, and think according to the self, which is corrupted by sin. Paul puts it this way in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 14. The natural person, being the person in the flesh, does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he's not able to understand them because they were spiritually discerned. I like to say this. Nobody was ever rationally argued into heaven. You ever try that? Years ago when I was a high school pastor, I had a student in our group that was... uh, He loved to argue, really smart, loved apologetics, loved the the reasons for God, and his whole goal was to prove his friends wrong so they'd become Christians. I'm like, I don't think it works that way, right? I've never met anybody yet who lost an argument and said, oh, therefore I will bow to your superior wisdom and become a Christian. No, the more you prove somebody wrong, the more they tend to dig in and get defensive, right? That's not how it works. Have you ever tried to explain, those of you who are followers of Jesus, have you ever had the experience like this where you've, Something, God has done something in your life, and you're trying to explain it to somebody or describe it to somebody who is not a follower of Jesus. And he can only go so far. There's a point at which they just kind of scratch their head, like, I don't get it. That's what Paul's saying. Yeah, you don't. Not because of something that, that you're not, that you're better than they are, but because something hasn't happened to them yet. They have not been transformed by the grace of Jesus Christ and placed in the Spirit. Given the spirit by which these things are ultimately spiritually discerned. That's what Paul's talking about here. This is why my friend scratched his head and thought the whole God stuff was boring and others were thrilled. Verse 7, Paul says that these people are hostile to God. And I know some of you read that and thought, whoa, 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 time out, Paul, wait a second. I know people who don't believe, but they're not enemies and hostile to God. Here's the point. What you and I think of as innocent indifference or neutral unbelief is actually an act of open defiance. Unbelief is saying this. This God of the universe who made everything that exists, who's beautiful and glorious beyond description, who formed us in his image, breathed life into our bodies, we see as, meh. You see as not worth your time, not worth believing in, or if believing in, maybe at a distance, certainly not worth surrendering to. If he exists at all, he's boring, and he's kind of an unappealing drag on my life and what I want to do with my life. Not worthy of my heart's affection. Think about that. On a less, um, on an imperfect level, the mother or father who raises their child in a loving home and that child rejects, runs away, rebels, 
wouldn't say I hate my parents, but behaves as if they don't matter to me at all. Is that neutral or indifferent or like, eh, you know, to each his own? No, it's heartbreaking to the parent. It's gut-wrenching. It's soul-destroying. The Bible says God made you. He formed you. He loves you. And to just think, eh, whatever, about him, that's what the Bible calls hostility toward God. We just want to give ourselves a pass and say, no, no, I'm not hostile. I'm just indifferent. There is no difference according to the Scripture. Then he says, does not submit to God's law. Because you cannot. Because you don't want to. It means the law of God, law of a good, holy, perfect, loving God may, that gives us to, to know what is right and good and true is an offense to us who want to live our own way. I do, or, or maybe for many of us in our culture, we pick and choose. This is what I notice. There are some things about the Bible I've heard people say that are really good. Love your, love your neighbor as yourself. I like that. Love your enemies. Do justice. Be humble. Yes, all good stuff. Lots of world religions teach that, and I believe in that. Sacrificial giving? Mm, depends. Forgiving those you know, who hurt you? Well, surrendering my will to the will of another? Ah, whoa, whoa, time out. Sexual purity? Whoa, whoa, wait a minute. I get to define what's right for me. We pick and choose, meaning we cannot submit to God's law. Not occasionally some part of it, but am I willing to surrender my will and say I live under the authority of another? That's a mark of somebody in the Spirit. And then he says, cannot please God. It all flows, one flows from the next. We cannot please God because we are, we do not, we're hostile to him in our hearts and we do not submit to his law. We hear things like, you know, be true to yourself. Follow your heart. Those are very dangerous words of advice if somebody's not in this, doesn't have this Holy Spirit living in them. I do not want to follow my heart if the Spirit of the living God is not ruling in my heart. You should not follow your heart or be true to yourself if the Spirit of God is not ruling and reigning in your heart. Because you'll lie to yourself. You'll lead yourself astray. The mind set on the things of the flesh is death, Paul says. Okay, let's maybe transition to some, some good news now. Let's be like, okay, we get it. It's bad to be in the flesh. But the point is, you, you can't change your mindset. You can't switch by sheer force of effort. Something has to happen to you. There must be a supernatural experience of grace to change this, the mindset on the spirit. Paul's saying that the Christian life is fundamentally, from beginning to end, Supernatural. You can't live it in your own strength. You don't, I, when I ask people, are you a Christian? And they say something like, well, I'm trying, I'm working at it, I hope to be. There's a fundamental misunderstanding. You're either in the flesh or in the spirit. You're either in Christ or you're not. And to be in Christ simply means I have surrendered my life to him. I, we did baptisms here on Easter Sunday. I prayed to receive forgiveness. I know that the God is, is my redeemer. I know I have no hope but him. I don't always live like that. I screw up, I stumble, I struggle but I have trusted in Christ. Then you have a mind set on the Spirit. Meaning your life to follow Jesus is fundamentally a life that's empowered by, equipped by, energized by, and sustained by the Holy Spirit of God living in you. Not your own moral effort and will. Look at verse 9. You, however, this is key. You, however, Paul's clearly drawn a distinction here. He's not saying, if you are doubting this idea that it's, that is it, is it Christian, non-Christian, or maybe it's a Christian who just struggles, he's saying you are different. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. Now, first of all, notice, there's the Spirit, Right? There's the Spirit of God, and there's the Spirit of Christ. Well, are there three spirits? No. These are three ways of saying the same thing. This is the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, God in three persons, the Spirit. And you see how the Trinity is all working together here in the, through the Spirit working in you. You, however, not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. 
The Spirit of God dwells in you. How do you know the Spirit of God dwells in you? Do, do you know? That the Spirit of God dwells in you? Is it experiential? Is it, do I feel it in certain times? We all have mountaintop experiences, moments when we feel close to God. That's not what Paul's talking about. Those things come and go. He says, you know the Spirit of God dwells in you if you're in Christ. Well, how do you know that? Have you trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ? Have you surrendered your life to him? If that's true, the Bible is crystal clear. Ephesians 1 tells us that the Spirit of God is given to you, comes and dwells in you as a deposit, a guarantee of what's to come. 1 Corinthians 5 tells us that God has given us his Spirit. It's our inheritance. Look at John 14, verses 16 through 17. This is Jesus speaking. I, Jesus, will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth. That's the Holy Spirit right there. Whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. We've talked about this years ago, but Jesus says to his disciples, who, when he says he's going away, and I would imagine if I was there on earth with Jesus, and he says, I have to leave, I'd be going, don't leave. Wouldn't you want to say that to Jesus? Don't leave us. And Jesus says, actually, it's better for you that I go away. How could that be, possibly be true? How could it be true that it's better for you that, that the physical presence of the Son of God goes away because of the one who will come and dwell in you? That means that the Spirit of God inside of you is better than the physical Son of God beside you. You believe that? The Spirit of God dwelling inside of you is what Paul is saying, is what energizes you, sustains you, equips you, empowers you to live the life God has called you. The distinguishing mark of the Christian is the presence of the Holy Spirit. Now that manifests itself in the fruit of the Spirit, in love, and forgiveness, and justice, and grace, and peace, and mercy, and all. We can go right down the list. But the distinguishing mark of the person who belongs to Jesus is the presence and power of the Spirit of God inside them. When you're with somebody and you feel as if, oh, there's something about him. When I hear him pray, I've got a friend who's a pastor in this community. His name is Dan. When he prays, I, I, I just want him to pray for me. I want to be around him when he prays. What is it? Because he's really smart and super spiritual? Well, he is really smart. But no, it's the Spirit of God in him that's coming out that I'm hearing and experiencing. When you're around somebody and you, they just exude kind of a presence of joy and peace and mercy, you've been around people like this, you just want to be near them. You leave their presence and you just feel encouraged. You feel inspired. Sometimes you feel convicted because of what God wants to do in your life that you're resisting. That's the Spirit of God in someone. We, oh, we say, oh, he's really wise, or she's really smart. True, as far as it goes. But it's the Holy Spirit of God in a person's life. This, this is the mark of the one who belongs to Jesus. So, then, so maybe you're wondering, well, I don't know, do I have the Spirit? First of all, believe what the Bible tells you. If you've trusted in Christ, you do. There are no non-spiritual Christians. If you're in Christ, you're in the Spirit, and the Spirit is in you. Let me ask you a few questions. Do you desire to know God more? Do you, de you can answer in your own heart. Do you desire to know and love God more than you do now? Do you desire, I want to know and experience His love more, or are you satisfied with what you have? Do you desire to be faithful and obedient to Him? Do you feel convicted and, and struggle with your disobedience? And you, even though it's a struggle, you deep down inside, if you strip away all the layers, you want to be faithful to God. Do you enjoy thinking about who He is and all that He's done for you in Christ? I was, this is the last few days of this past week, I was in Eugene, Oregon, with a group of pastors visiting with another pastor, learning from them in a pastor's cohort. And we spent some time uh, just encouraging each other in the Spirit praying for each other out loud. I love those guys. And I love when we get together and talk about what Christ has done for us. We're pastors of churches all over the country. And what we love most is to talk about what Jesus has done for us. You don't have to think about what God has done for you in Christ. Do you long to worship him? I don't just mean sing a song, but to pour out your heart to him. Do you long to hear from him? Doesn't mean you always do, but deep down inside is that your desire. When you screw up, do you know that when you confess, he liberates you? 
He's forgiven you. He set you free. Those are all marks of the Spirit in a person. All right, last two verses. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead, your physical body is dead because of the sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. Not your righteousness, but that of Jesus Christ who died on your behalf. Now, this last verse, verse 11, is if you're going to memorize Scripture, even if you're not, you should memorize this verse right here. This is fantastic. I want you to read this with me. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. What a verse. If the spirit of the one who raised Jesus Christ from the dead, four weeks ago we celebrated Easter, the resurrection. We celebrated Resurrection Sunday. By the way, in case you've forgotten, he's still risen. If the spirit of the one who raised Jesus from the dead, which is our only hope, dwells in you, pause right there, think about that. Do you believe that the spirit of God who raised the son of God from the grave has come into your life and dwells in you? I tremble to think about that. If that is true, then that same spirit will give life to your mortal bodies. What does that mean? It's tempting to think, well, that just means someday I go to heaven and I get a new body. Yes, that is true. But he's also talking about life right now. Full life, abundant life, whole life, by the spirit, living in you right now. Where are you stuck, friends, in your life? Where are, do you feel like I just... I'm just stuck here. Is there an addiction? Is there a relationship? Is there just a messed up way of thinking that you feel stuck in? If the spirit of him who raised Jesus Christ from the dead dwells in you, then he can handle that. He can deal with that. Let him. Walk in it. You are according to the spirit. You have a mind set on the spirit. Live that way. Not by trying harder, but by surrendering to the one who dwells in you. I think of it this way. This is an imperfect analogy, but I was flying home from Eugene, Oregon, and I I read, I I was bored, my ear pods died. So (laughs) my book was above, and I I didn't want to get up out of my seat, because anyway, the whole point is. So I'm reading the, the, the information on the seat back in front of me. Do you know that a Boeing 767 weighs 175,000 pounds? That's without you or your luggage in it. 175,000 pounds. How does 175,000 pounds fly? I was thinking about this sermon and I was bored and I was reading this, right? How does 175,000 pounds of steel and metal and, and, and fly? It seems like an impossibility. But there are other principles that you don't understand that are at work, right? There's principle of, of thrust and lift, and it does. I don't get it, but it does. Imperfectly, if the Spirit of God dwells in you, nothing is impossible in your life. That which you feel like, I just, I, I, this, is, I, this, is my, this is my burden, I can't get past it. You can. He dwells in you. There are operating principles in your life that you have only just begun to understand or tap into. Next week is part two of the Spirit. We're going to talk more about how we access that and walk in that. I want you to leave here today on this Mother's Day, you're going to go to brunch and do whatever you're going to do, but I want you to leave with this encouragement. If the Spirit of God that raised Jesus Christ from the dead dwells in you, then whatever God intends for your life can be done. It can be done. Let's pray. God, thank you for this opportunity to open your word. We fall so far short. Our minds are so inadequate to understand the power of what you've done, what you're doing, and who you are. Forgive us for trying to live a life you've called us to live in our own strength, by our own power. That is an impossibility, and we repent of it. Holy Spirit, speak to our hearts this morning. Convince us that we have a new mind set on the things of the Spirit, and a new power, and a new identity. We give you all the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Singing that song, there's a line, the strength to follow your commands could never come from me. That's true comes from the Spirit of God living in me and living in you. Brothers and sisters, go in the power 
the grace, the wisdom, and the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. And may you know that the spirit of him who raised him from the dead dwells in you. Amen? And go in peace. And happy Mother's Day.